supposed to be doing something today, and I uh, looked at my clock and it was, it was watching it was 10 o'clock. Um, so I'm already a minute late. It's good to have everybody today. We are um, celebrating uh, New Year's today down here in Calvary, and uh, we, we have kind of a, a little bit of a skeleton crew here today, but thankful with everybody that was able to come out today. And our pastor and his wife were up in uh, Michigan, and he had just texted me, and what did he tell me? <laughs> um, anyway, but I think he was telling me I better get started. So uh, he said good morning from Michigan. I believe that's what he says. So they'll be uh, we're watching online, and we should welcome them as well, and others that are joining us this morning. Seems like everybody's dragging just a little bit here. So uh, we got a couple songs. Uh, before we do that, uh, Miss Betty had put together a calendar, a January calendar is in the bulletin, so grab that and, um, and use that for the upcoming year, or the upcoming month, that rather works, and um, we appreciate her doing that and also the bulletin. So, got one song here, is, uh, In Loving Kindness, Jesus Came, and um, Lynn Kimmel's over there. I, I want to introduce her, if y'all hadn't met Lynn. Uh, She's over there playing the piano today. We're thankful for that. And uh, my dad's gone, so we appreciate her. If I get off cue, you just keep going. Um, I, I'm likely to do that because I was up to way after midnight last night, and I'm not off here this morning. So let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing In Loving Kindness, Jesus Came. <clears throat>
singing there. It sounds great. Um, I hope y'all have read the announcements because I haven't, but I'm supposed to be uh, announcing. I do know today that you know, Brother Bill's going to be going to Mulligan Park and Heath's going to be going to help with the singing down there. I guess Miss Carol will be going with Brother Bill. We appreciate them doing that. And uh, also, uh, I've already said something about the, the calendar. Oh, I wanted to mention that also the International Mission uh, the envelopes are still on the back table and we're still giving to that call. So uh, if you'd like to do that, we can uh, pass out those as well. Or you can pick up a, an envelope on the back back there. Um, this Wednesday night, we, we will have all of our uh, Wednesday night activities and uh, all the youth and, and young folks will be and also Brother Duke's been leading us in a uh, study of the book of Ecclesiastes and it is very interesting. Um, he has been he's been teaching out of that book for how many weeks, Duke? Uh, ten or eleven. Several? Ten or eleven. Ten, ten or eleven weeks and like we'll get through what two or three or four or five verses <clears throat> and um, and it's just like amazing, you know, some of the stuff that comes out of that. You read, you read the Ecclesiastes, and I get hardly nothing out of it, but Duke's been bringing it to us and dividing it up, separating it out for us where I can even understand it. We appreciate that. So, um, Plex, um, also, if your excuse for not coming is because you're behind, you can catch up on YouTube. All of his previous Ecclesiastes are on uh, Calvary Baptist 1884, so okay. you don't have an excuse not to be here. Okay, that's uh, that's that high tech stuff that I know very little about. But if you if you go to YouTube and uh, we even have that on our television now, we haven't run run all that. But you can go and you can uh, pull it up under Calvary Baptist 1884, Calvary Baptist Church 1884 YouTube, and it should pop up, and you'll have a series of all the studies there, and also all the Sundays are on there. All the Sunday messages are on there as well. So. Am I being on? I'm gonna be on YouTube. You're on YouTube. Oh, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. <laughs> but anyway, um, all right. Well, I'll, that's that's all I have as far as announcements there. So I guess it's time for the men to come forward to have our tithes and offerings, and then we'll have our children's message. <clears throat> we'll ask Wayne if he'd get prepared to to uh, pray for the offering. You will. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Father God, we come to you this morning, Lord, with a brand new day and a brand new year. Lord, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for all the, the many blessings of life. Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that you just give us peace and, and health and prosperity to our church and our church members and those watching online. Lord, we just ask that you just be with us throughout this new year. Just keep your guiding hand upon us, Lord. And and, uh, and give us uh, health and safety. Lord, we just uh, pray for those that's on our, our prayer list. Lord, it's, uh, it, it's, it's getting to be a pretty long list. Lord, but we know that you know the, the individual needs of each one. Lord, we just pray that, Lord, that you just lift each one of them up and, and be the great physician and heal them for your will. Lord, we just uh, Thank you, Lord, for Calvary Baptist Church and what it means to us in this community and those around about us, Lord. And we just pray that you just be with our church through this next year, Lord. Just give, give us growth and, and prosperity as we move forward and our witness to you. Lord, now for this offering we're about to receive, we just ask that you just take it, bless it, use it for the ongoing of thy kingdom, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for everything. Amen.
have our children's time now. Last year on Christmas, my son and his wife put together this calendar and it's got all kind of pictures on it for every month and then it's got a place where you can write your appointments and stuff. So there's April's appointments, there's May's appointments, there's June all filled up with swimming lessons and there's July and all of the fun things that I did this year. But yesterday was December the 31st, right here. So what did I need for today? Another calendar. So do you think my son and his wife gave me another calendar? <laughs> <clears throat> Yay! Another calendar filled with pictures of this year. But it's a little different. First of all, the pictures are different. We're still cute and all that stuff. And the pictures are different. But look, this is January 2023. This was 2022. So this has happened. It's in the past. It is not in the future. Now I'm probably going to keep this just because the pictures are all so precious and I can look back and see what I did in 2022. But this is the one I'm concentrating on now. So if I have an appointment like tomorrow, I have a dentist appointment at 10 o'clock and I have a haircut appointment at 1 o'clock right there. But look, everything else is empty. I don't know. In fact, none of us know. Because this is the future. And in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes 8, 7, it says, since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? We don't know. I could put it down on this calendar and it would be there. But there's no guarantee it would happen because we don't really know what's going to happen in the future. But we can have peace knowing who holds our future. And that's Jesus Christ. So even though we only know about today and this present and what's going on right now, we don't have to worry about the future. We don't have to worry about it. Because we know Jesus Christ has it. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for time. And thank you so much to allowing us to have time here on this earth. Thank you for giving us today. And help us to live it the way you would have planned it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Also, I want to thank the uh, committee, I guess it's a committee, uh, Johnny kind of headed it up to take down all the Christmas decorations. And uh, with all the, the tree is back up in the attic, all the things down, as far as I know everything's down, but anyway, we appreciate the ones that helped out on that. And uh, it is a job every year, it has to be done, we appreciate that. So I have the next song here. We're going to be singing the wonder of it all. We'll stand for this one, and then Brother Duke's going to come and preach. So we're looking forward to that. The wonder of it all. <laughs>
It's New Year's Day. Happy New Year. I want to tell you what we did last night at my house before I start. We watched football. <laughs> and I have two witnesses here, my daughter Suzanne and Pam. We were watching a football game. It's the only football game ever. Georgia. Ohio State. Ohio State was about to kick a field goal. And Candy jumped up and left the room. And she went almost to the living room. And she was screaming at the top of her lungs. Miss it! Miss it! And I thought, there's no way this guy's going to miss this kid. And he kicked the ball nowhere near the goalpost. It went at least as far as that wall away from the center of the game. So Candy won the game last night <laughs> through prayer. It wasn't really prayer. I didn't hear her say God at all. She was just screaming. But it's New Year's. Christians get excited about the new year. This could be the year of, I know you're excited now, engaged, going to be married. Great year. But it's a great year for Christians because we get excited about maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the time when all the prophecy in the Bible is going to come to pass. We don't know that. And sometimes we get so busy we don't think about it. But it's an issue that we should think about. We should be grateful for. God wants us to look forward to the rapture, to heaven, to eternity. I can't imagine what that would be like. None of us can. We try to think hard about what it might be like to live forever and know the answers to all things and know everything that Jesus knows. We're going to be like him. We're not now. I know you are. I, I'm close. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we all know we're nothing like Jesus now. We're forgiven sinners. Over the years, Christianity has uh, had some differences of opinion about what took place at the time of Christ's birth. Is this me making those noises? Eight. My guess is it's me making the noise. I'm sorry. Some of the confusion is based on our lack of clarity in the Bible itself about what took place at the time Jesus was born. I thought this might be a good time a good time for us to discuss some of these issues. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time of year that's so special in the lives of Christians. We think of Christ's birth. We think of what his coming meant to mankind. We think about his life. We think about his ministry. We think about his death. All of these things come to our mind, even though it's Christmas time and it's a celebration of his birth. I pray, Father, that you would clarify some things for us from your word this morning. Not because of my study or my words, but because of what, what is written in the Bible concerning the coming of Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. 
A star. A star? Over the years, um, there's been a celebration of this star. And the secular world has turned that star into something that it wasn't. It's a little magical light. It floats around about treetop height and moves and leads kings from the east. And it comes and rests upon the place where Jesus was living at the time they arrived. It's like this little thing. We've seen that on uh, television shows about this subject. This, this magical thing that defies gravity. And it's kind of close to the earth. It wasn't that. Of course it wasn't that. There were wise men in the east, and most probably they were in the area of Babylon or Persia, which is only about 800 miles from Jerusalem. And they see something that they were expecting, I imagine. And the reason they were expecting it, because they have they had heard that there would be such a star. And how did they hear that? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But you remember Daniel got carried away captive to Babylon. And he went there and he became a high-ranking person in both the Babylonian and the, uh, the Persian empires. And I'm sure he knew about this verse in Numbers chapter 24 that says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Shem. This star was prophesied in the Old Testament. It's the star that was in the night sky. I know a little bit about astronomy, but enough to really get me in trouble. I'm not going to stand up here as an astronomer and talk about this star. But there was a guy that did. He lived in the late 1600s and the early 1700s. His name was Johannes Kepler. And Kepler turned the world upside down, and he became a heretic according to the Roman Catholic Church, and they wanted to kill him because Kepler, in the late 1600s, figured out star movement and planetary movement, and all of his findings are used today because he was right about that. Can you imagine? I mean, this guy didn't have so much as 10 power telescope to look at the night sky. And he discovered how planets moved and how stars moved. And became highly sought by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted to kill him. And this is what he this is what he determined. You know if you go outside at night and you stand looking to the north, it seems as though all of the stars rise in the east, go overhead, and if you stay out there all night, which none of us have ever really done, stared at the sky all night, I don't think, but they rise in the east and they set in the west. And it looks like that goes on every night. It changes the, the, what's in the sky at any time of day changes from season to season because we are in an orbit around the sun and the earth is moving through space and so our view of the night sky at 10 o'clock tonight isn't going to be what our view of the night sky at 10 o'clock on <coughs> July 1st is going to be. It's different. They're moving. They're not really moving. The earth is rotating and we're traveling in an orbit. Well, Kepler found out that that was true. 
And he said, those stars don't move like that. They're not moving. We're moving. And the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church wanted to kill him. You mean the earth isn't the center of the universe? So Kepler figures out what the kings of the east saw in the night sky when they started from wherever they were, Persia probably. I doubt they were in India. They were in Babylon, Persia, somewhere there. They come across the desert and they might have come up the Euphrates River to the north and come over so they were close to the water with their animal. But they arrive in Jerusalem, and they go to King Herod. And they ask a question. They say to King Herod, we've come from the east, and we're here to find the king. Herod was a madman. He killed many people in his own family because he was worried they were trying to take over his throne. He'd kill anybody to stay in power. And so <coughs> Herod says, oh, please tell me. When did, when did this all happen? When did you see the star? And what did He starts asking questions because he's nervous. He doesn't want another king. He's the king. And if you look in the Bible, where we are, we're in Matthew, chapter 2. Here it gathers all the the priests and scribes of the temple together. And he demanded, that's the only thing here, that he, he didn't ask anybody anything, he demanded. Don't do that in marriage, by the way. Don't make demands. <laughs> Candy does all the time. But she's not here. She's like, <laughs> I'm kidding. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they all knew. Micah the prophet, in chapter 5 and verse 2, I think, said he was going to be born in Bethlehem. And so they answered him. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. Then Herod calls the wise men, and he inquires of them diligently. I'm sorry. Herod is a worm of a person. He inquires of them diligently what time the star appeared. He wants to know when did this happen? And they give him an answer. And the answer they gave him must have been somewhere around a year. He first saw the star a year ago, maybe a year and a couple of months. We know that from another verse in the same chapter. Verse 8. Chapter 2 in Matthew. And he sent them to Bethlehem 
and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. That's what I want. I want a new king. I'm the king. Herod didn't want a new king. The only reason Herod was interested in a new king was because he wanted to kill him. That's what he did to people who would become king instead of him. He had already done it more than once. He's going to do it again. He sent them to Bethlehem. He said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, this, this magical star, it wasn't that one. It wasn't the one that's floating around a treetop level like some of the Christmas stories show us on television. You've seen that. It wasn't like that. These men are wise. They know astronomy. When they look in the sky and they see things moving, they know that they're special because they've heard the prophecy. Per I'm only saying perhaps Daniel was the one that taught people. I mean, he was 600 years before Jesus was born. But people in the East would have known the things that he said about the coming Messiah. And so they, they learned these things, these wise men. We don't know how many there were. We say three because of the gifts. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. But we don't know how many there were. There might have been more, there might have been two. When they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Time out. Have you ever seen a star do that? Yeah, you, you have. You just didn't know it. Stars do that all the time. Stars will move from east to west. And if you watch them closely over time, They'll start moving back from west to east. They move. How can that be? Well, it really planets. Kepler figured out how that happened. It's called retrograde movement of planets. And here's what happens. I don't know if I can demonstrate this to you. Picture on our ceiling an oval. That oval is the path of a planet. Now, most of the time, am I on this mic? Am I on this mic? Why have I got this on? <laughs> just, just picture an oval on the ceiling. And we're going to go from east to west. And the planet is traveling in this direction. It's a little, and it turns, and it starts going that way, from west to east. And this happens all the time. We will watch a planet, and we'll see it come up, go back down. We see Venus, called the evening star, rise and set. We'll see it called when it's called the morning star, it comes up in the morning, in the east, at different times of the year. And this retrograde movement causes, when one looks in the sky, to see what looks like a star, but is a planet, move like this, and then, over time, move back. This is what I think the wise men of the East, who were astronomers, 
knew, were not surprised about. They expected this to happen. And when it happened, it, they didn't fall off their camels and scream, what's going on? They knew. And I'll tell you who else knew. Johannes Kepler knew. And Kepler figured out what was going on on any day in history what the sky looked like. And there are videos you can watch about what the sky looked like at this time. And it describes exactly what the Bible says the wise men saw. But we live in a world of commercialism. It's funny, the, the Central American countries where Candy and I have done mission work have a different way of celebrating Christmas. Uh, they have the nativity scene in their home, in one room. And then they go to the furthest, furthest place in their home. In, in Central American homes, that's not very far. But it might be the same room. But if it's another room, that's where the wise men are kept. And they're kept there throughout Christmas. And they are brought to where Jesus is later, just as is described here in Matthew chapter 2. Why? Because the wise men weren't there. They come to Jerusalem from wherever they came from. And they ask the king, Herod, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And probably practically choking, Herod asks the, the religious leaders, what's he talking about? What are they? What king? Who's what king? He didn't know anything about the prophecy in the Old Testament concerning Christ's coming. Didn't want to know about it. All he knew was if somebody thinks they're king, I'm going to kill them. When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Where was Jesus? He wasn't in the state. It was after that. Was Joseph in the state? Yeah. Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. But when these guys show up and they see the star moving in the sky and coming back, and they go, whoa, right down south from Jerusalem. There's the star. Let's go there. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were come, this is interesting, verse 11. They come into the house. What house? The house where Jesus was. They go into this house, not the stable, and the star came to rest, to stop in retrograde movement. And it's above some house in. Bethlehem. And they go in and they only find Mary and Jesus. Where's Joseph? Joseph was in the stable. He wouldn't have left the stable any time during that night that his, his son was born. Joseph is probably working as a carpenter. 
while Mary is recovering. And they're in this house. There is some conjecture over whether the house was even in Bethlehem. It may have been in Jerusalem. But the Bible's silent about that. They know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They send the wise men toward there and they see the star stop over a house. They go in the house and Mary and Joseph are there alone, the two of them. They give Jesus the gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Very expensive things. The frankincense and myrrh is to be used on people who die. They didn't embalm people. Them. They poured ointment over them. Frankincense smells good. Her smells even more subtle. Beautiful smell. And they poured that over their clothing. And they're bringing this to a newborn baby. Most likely signifying the death that he would die. Because that was done for Jesus when he died. And gold little bit of gold goes a long way, especially back then. So they've got money. They came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So they don't, they don't go back and say anything to Herod. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. So they go and live in Egypt. Now here's something that's very important in this chapter. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt? Not that he's an Egyptian, but that he was living in Egypt. And when Herod died, and I want to say a couple of words about that because you're going you're gonna to read secular uh, writings that say that King Herod died in 4 B.C., four years before the birth of Christ. No, he didn't. That error is attributed to a misprint that occurred long after Josephus wrote the works of Josephus, and he wrote in there a date of when Herod died, and it got changed by some scribe by mistake. And from the time of Josephus, which was around the time of Christ, Christ is an adult, until now, the world has said King Herod died in 4 BC, four years before the birth of Christ. It's not true. King Herod and Jesus were contemporaries. They lived on the earth at the same time. Don't worry about what you read elsewhere. I think Satan is at work trying to confuse people who study the Bible. And he has power to do that. But anyway, they're, they were contemporaries. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So Joseph says, I got word from God we got to get out of here. And they traveled to Egypt. How could they do that? Well, it wasn't very far. Maybe 250 miles. 
So they go there, and what do they do? Well, they rent a place to live, I imagine. They got gold, <laughs> frankincense, and myrrh. They can trade these things. They're expensive. And they wait. And they wait until God calls Joseph to return to Israel, which is what he does. But in the meantime, Herod's up to his dirty tricks. And he says, Joseph arose, he, he took the young child, his mother, by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod. So Jesus is alive, and Herod is alive at the same time. Herod didn't die in 4 BC. You read that in a lot of secular writing. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. That's an Old Testament prophecy. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath, and sent forth and slew all the children, this is a key verse, all the children which were in Bethlehem and in the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So if, if the wise men had been at the stable, like secular, secularists tell us, they are kneeling at the stable, they would have said, well, he was just born recently. But he told them, that the wise men told King Herod, when he asked him, what time did the star appear? They had to say, oh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a month. And the reason he killed everybody, from all the male children from two years of age and under, it wasn't overkill that much on his part. He thought, well, in order to get the guy that's supposed to be king, I'm going to have to kill everybody under the age of two. And he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem in the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, that would not be comforted, because they are not. That's Herod for you. But in verse 19, this is kind of a happy verse. But when Herod was dead, I like that verse. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. It's time to go back. Those that wanted to kill your son are dead. So much had happened in Joseph's life that was so bizarre that had come to pass exactly the way God had told him that he was listening. And I don't know what kind of an announcement that was while they were in Egypt. He was probably working as a carpenter in a home that they rented. They had gold. I don't know how much gold they had, but it was enough to stay as long as they needed to stay for Herod to die. And they come home. And they live in Nazareth. And you know the rest of the story. God had his hands on the one who was going to live a perfect life not be killed by a mad king, go to the cross, sinless, die, be placed in a tomb. 
I laid down the night too. Not where Jesus would have been, but he would tell me that they think is the one Jesus was laid in. He rose from the dead. There's a stone there. All of us in this church couldn't move that stone. Wasn't a problem to God. Jesus rose from the dead. He's the Jesus that is the reason we come here. Johannes Kepler believed in Christ as a savior. He was considered a heretic by the church. They wanted to kill him. Throughout history, secularists have made the birth of Christ and the star of Bethlehem a cartoon that no one could believe in. It wasn't like that. The most learned men on earth at the time of Christ's birth were looking at the heavens and realized something huge was happening. And they came and they found our Lord and Savior Jesus as a little boy with his mom at home. Here it didn't get him. Got a lot of other innocent children who was weeping and crying. But the one he was after escaped so he could become my Savior Amen. and yours. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for. loving us. We don't know why you love us, but we know that you do. We know that you have a plan for all men, that they would come to know Christ and win. You make the gospel so easy to understand. I've seen five-year-olds get it become Christians. I thank you for saving my father in the last year of his life. He fought his whole life because of the things that had happened to him. You reached him. What a joy. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the birth of Jesus his perfect life, your protection of him until the time came when it was time for him to die for all of mankind. What a God you are. We thank you. We pray that we could be your witnesses here on earth and tell everyone we, we know about Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brother Dave, we're going to turn now and sing, uh, I have decided to follow Jesus, to stand and sing, we Smith. <laughs>
afternoon, and we thank you, Lord Brother Dick, for bringing that message to us. And, and I was going to ask uh, Brother Neil if he would pray this message. Mm -hmm. Well, God, thank you, Lord, for what you are in our life. Thank you for what you mean to us as our personal Savior. Lord, thank you for this church and what it means to this community. And Lord, it just bless the membership and the people that you bring in our midst, Lord. That we, we thank you for that. that we know there's no accidents where you're concerned with it. If our people are called by your name, gathered together here in Calvary, uh, it's because you want us here. Lord, we just praise you. We ask for your guidance this coming year. And uh, let 2023 be a year 